Hi there. Thank you for joining me this morning. And um, so first of all, I just want to thank you for joining me because I know that on the internet, there are so many videos out there nowadays, and there's so many things you could be doing, so many things you could be watching. So I appreciate you joining me at my home on what is Friday morning Pacific time uh, here in California at 10.30 or 10.45, sorry. Now I know somebody commented and laughed and I loved that comment, by the way. The person who wrote um, something to the effect, I'm paraphrasing, about I like the way you wrote around 10.30 a.m. That's really an act of self-care. And I loved that comment because, uh, and the reason why we write around whatever it is, around 11 a.m., around 10.30 a.m., is for those of you who don't know, um, we don't use an, like a smartphone, an iPhone for this video. My husband has this whole production thing set up because he's such a, he's such a techie geek, such a nerd, and he records this on his uh, on his professional video camera because what we then do is we upload it to YouTube and then he also turns it into a podcast and we put it on iTunes and we also send it out in our newsletter so that he can use it multiple in multiple media and uh, and so this is why he has this whole thing in the background so for those of you who've often asked me what does Danny do well, that's the kind of stuff he does. He's my uh, IT tech guy. He's everything. He's also my road manager when we travel. He takes care of logistics. I mean, I just couldn't do what I do without him. Which takes me to the video that we had last week where I asked him to pop in, where he showed his face. So if those of you haven't watched it, that was uh, recorded last Sunday. And uh, we talked about Danny having Asperger's and I got a lot of amazing feedback for that video. A lot of people really, really enjoyed hearing what I had to say. Um, and we managed, we even got a discussion going like people were writing into me and people were commenting, <clears throat> speaking more about Asperger's. And, and I spoke about how he has Asperger's <clears throat> and I have realized recently that taking an empathy test that I am an empath. So I want to say, first of all, is that actually I have since my near death experience. And for those of you who are tuning in for the first time and who don't know my backstory, um, I had cancer for four years, which led to end stage cancer. And I was supposed to die. I went into a coma and the doctors said, basically I was dead. My organs were shutting down and I was not coming back. But what actually happened was I left my physical body and I transitioned to the other realm and realized it wasn't my time. And I did come out of the coma and I did heal. And that was 12 years ago. That was in February of 2006. And when I was in that other realm, I realized that when we are without our physical body, we're not only just without the biological physical body, I realized I was also without my gender, my race, my culture, my religion, and all the beliefs that I had accumulated over a lifetime, all the labels, all the beliefs, everything fell away when I was in the other realm. And all that was left was pure essence. But here's the interesting thing. Without all those labels, which I thought defined me, I was actually something far greater. This pure essence that I was, pure love, pure God, we can call it whatever we want. Um, I call it sometimes my inner mystic, my guidance, my connection to the universe. That part of me that crossed over, the part of you that crosses over, that is not part of your physical body, um, that part of me was far bigger. And I realized in that realm that all these labels, these labels of my gender, my race, my religion, and so on, they actually limited who I am. They didn't define me. They limited who I am and who I really am is far greater and far more powerful. So ever since that experience, I had rejected labels. Yet at the same time, over the years, I've realized that if we can 
reject labels and realize we're something far greater, but at the same time realize that sometimes labels are words, they're useful descriptions, but they don't define us. But we can still learn from the descriptions. It's actually really helpful because subsequently what started to happen was that, um, you see, my husband Danny and I were extremely close. And when I was going through the illness, he was incredible at helping me through it. He was amazing at helping to take care of me. Nothing seemed to wear him down. Nothing seemed to phase him. He was always there and he never got drained. You know, it was like he was, um, in fact, he was in his element when, when I was going through the illness and I relied on him in a way like I haven't relied on anybody. It was like he was my lifeline and I would feel safe when he was there with me. It was like he knew what I wanted and needed before I even needed it. And one day um, after I healed, and you know, and, and the thing about Danny, he's also extremely detailed. He's very techy. He can be a bit nerdy and he's just a really great guy. Um, but a friend of ours actually suggested that Danny take this test for, for Asperger's. So for the fun of it, Danny took the test and he scored really high. In other words, he had something that was called Asperger's, which is part of the um, autistic syndrome, which is a high functioning autism. And when we started reading about it, and this was quite a few years ago, because this friend of ours apparently also has it relates to it. When we started reading it, we were fascinated as to how much Danny related to it and how much it applied to him. And what happened is we didn't reject it as a label. We adopted it and studied it because it helped us to learn and study who he is. Uh, and it helped me to learn more about him and how his mind works and how his thinking process works, which actually made us even closer. It made him understand himself more and it made me understand him more. And it even, it helped us to become even closer. So, but the interesting thing, so this was a few years ago and we had been reading about it. And although he doesn't, uh, um, he doesn't identify with everything, uh, you know, in the, Asperger, in the Asperger syndrome, he identifies with many, but not everything. So the thing to keep in mind is never wear it as a label and be aware that everybody is unique, everybody is different, and there are certain things you'll relate to. But um, anyway, as I decided to take the test for myself, and I scored like really low, like really low, like uh, almost rock bottom, as low as, almost as low as you can get on, on that scale, on that score. I didn't give it a second thought. But then one day, um, and over time, I received letters from people and there were a couple of people that had said to me that they think I might be an empath, they think I might be an empath. And so I kind of thought, yeah, that's really interesting. But I never read up on it. I never really thought about it. But um, I thought it's probably true, but I never had the time to get into it or read more about it. Anyway, one day we were at a dinner party and we were talking about Asperger's syndrome because um, Danny was talking about it and it turned out there were two other people at this dinner party that said they had taken the test and they knew they scored high on it. They knew they had it. And, and usually they verify it with several tests. You don't just take the word of one test. They had taken several tests online and they related to all the material about it. So anyway, this dinner party, there were quite a few of us and the host decided just for fun, she was going to send everybody who was attending the party, the link to the test. And she said, let's all take it and just see where we are on the scale. And we thought, oh, that's great. It was like a party game. So every single person in the dinner party took the test. Now, just to give you an idea. So let's say the highest you can score is 45. But anybody who was over, I don't know, 25, 28, 30, was considered to have Asperger's. And Danny scored way up there, like near 40. So there were um, actually five people at the dinner party who scored pretty high. 
And anybody who was over 18, uh, who scored over 18, was considered normal, like anywhere between, um, let's say, 17 to 20, 17 to 22, you were considered normal. So most of the people at the party scored normal. And a few of them scored slightly below normal, a few of them scored slightly higher than normal, but you had them kind of starting from 16, going upwards all the way into Asperger's. I was the only one that scored rock bottom. And I'm talking like I scored three or something like that. So it was like there's me and a big gap and then the next one. That's when I started to get curious. What does that mean? What if you score rock bottom on the SP test? What does that say about you? So I started looking at the kinds of questions that they ask on these ASPE tests. And the questions were things like, are you really good at boundaries? Are you good at compartmentalizing? Are you good? And those are the ones where Danny is really good at. And I'm even talking about compartmentalizing our emotions. I'm terrible at that. And he's good at that. And it doesn't mean he's not sensitive. He's extremely sensitive. He's sensitive to sound. He's sensitive to light. He's aware of his emotions. He's aware of other people's emotions, but he doesn't take them on as his own. And that's where I started to realize, ah, that's the difference. So I realized I need to take a different kind of test, which is an empath test. And that's, and that's where I scored 29 out of 30 and Danny scored rock bottom. So here's the difference. Again, it doesn't mean if you have Asperger's, you're not sensitive. You can be extremely sensitive. But I realized empathy is something that's completely different. Empathy is when you wear the emotions of other people on your own body, when you can feel it physically within your own body. I started to realize, oh my gosh, you know, when my best friend had cancer all those years ago, I felt it. I felt it in my body. I didn't know I was different. I used to admire the people that could be doctors, that could be in the healing profession and work with sick people. I didn't know how they did it because I would feel so drained because I was wearing those fear emotions. Now, here's the interesting thing about if you score high on an empath scale is that on the one hand, you feel what everyone is feeling. So those people that are going through challenges, they want you around. My best friend wanted me there. She wanted me with her because she knew I could feel what she was feeling. And it was such a comfort to have me there. But yet, when you are that sort of person, you're absorbing their feelings. And so you may be good for them but you're not good for you. And I didn't realize that. I didn't have that knowledge. So now starting to learn that and to see that, then, oh my gosh, empathy is a double-edged sword. It's a gift and it's a curse. I've started to realize that. And I've started to realize that a lot of my work, a lot of the things I write, a lot of the things I speak about, my books, my blogs, are attracting a lot of empaths. and. We know how to help other people, but we don't know how to compartmentalize our emotions so that we're taking care of ourselves. And the problem with empaths is that sometimes even the very act of taking care of yourself makes you worried as to whether you're going to be offending or hurting the person that you're taking care of. It makes you feel guilty. I mean, that's what it used to do to me. But one thing I will say is that learning more about it and reading about it and becoming aware of it has certainly helped me understand better what it is that I have. And it's made me realize that um, it's actually something that a lot of people have, but not everybody has it. Not everybody feels this way. Not everybody relates to it. And so in the same way, that when I was reading and studying up on Asperger's in order to understand Danny better, um, reading about empaths for Danny has helped him to understand me better. 
And what he now understands is that the way he feels an on, the way he feels an overload of sensation when he is amongst loud sounds or a lot of or too much light or too much um, information coming at him, I feel that way when there's too much um, too much emotion being shared, when there's too much emotion coming at me, when I am with people who are sad, I feel it right away. And I'm sure many of you tuning in, you do too. You feel the emotions of other people in a room. And I also then started to understand, and here's the next piece I want to share with you. I understood why, say for me, why I've always disliked hospitals. Because when I'm in a hospital, I actually feel the fear emotions, the sickness emotions of all the people around me. Whereas somebody like Danny is actually able to compartmentalize. And he's somebody that this is why he was so good at taking care of me. I mean, I think that people who have Asperger's are really good with things like um, if they had to take care of sick people, if they had to react in an emergency, if they have to be firefighters, paramedics, surgeons, they're really good at, at, uh, at doing things like that. Whereas an empath will feel and know what needs to be done, but an empath has to be really careful that they're not absorbing that emotion and then draining themselves. And that's kind of where I want to go with this is how do we do that? So first of all, I, uh, for me, I would say if it were up to me, hospitals would be very different. Um, I mean, I remember one time when I was sharing my story, um, very shortly after it happened to me two, one or two years after I had come, you know, healed of the cancer and I was invited to speak at the medical um, faculty in, at the, in Hong Kong. And I was invited to share my story. And I shared what happened. I shared how I was healed so rapidly. And then at the end of it, I asked, um, uh, I asked this, the audience if they had questions. The audience consisted of the medical faculty and students, students who were uh, medical students, basically, students who were studying to be oncologists and doctors. One of the students said to me, how many years ago, how long ago did this happen? And I said, whatever, I think a year and a half, two years. And then he said to me, um, you're still in remission. You shouldn't be sharing your story now until five years have passed because technically you're still in remission and you know that the chances of the cancer coming back within five years are really high. Now, here's what blew me about this. I knew because of the experience I had that it wasn't going to come back within the five years. But what blew me was that I didn't blame the, the young man for, for thinking that way because that's how he was taught to think. But what um, blew me was that people with this, this feeling, this carrying this energy, even if they don't say it out loud, but people with this belief are the ones who are treating the patients. And empathic patients pick up on this energy. They actually pick up on it. And I started to understand, this is why I don't like hospitals. I actually pick up on the energies of the doctors and the nurses. And so if it were up to me, hospitals wouldn't be the way they are. They would be healing centers where the health givers, the nurses, the doctors would have a tremendous amount of healing and support themselves so that they come from a very different space so that what they're sharing with the patient is their energy, not just the medicine and the teachings that they bring, not just their knowledge and not just their expertise, but also the energy they bring because we take ourselves wherever we go. And there are a lot of people who navigate through this world feeding off the energy of the other people or being affected by energies of the other people. So it would be so important for me for hospitals to realize this. And instead of being hospitals, they would, could be healthcare sanctuaries, which was for the purpose of healing their patients, not treating the sick, not searching for illness, but for taking people to optimum health instead. Um, 
The other tools that I would give to people, generally, anybody who's tuning in, if you relate to what I'm saying, here are some of the things I suggest to you. First of all, be aware. Be aware that you're someone like that if you are, if you're someone who absorbs energies around you. Just be aware you do that. Um, and that really helps a lot. The number two thing I would say is that learn to say no. And by that, I mean, I don't mean be mean or nasty, none of that. Saying no means being kind to yourself. So learn to take time off for yourself and start to ask yourself, am I doing things that I don't want to do, but I'm doing them because I can't say no to other people? See, the thing about empaths is if you think about a smartphone, um, your smartphone needs to recharge. The batteries discharge. They're like the whole time that the smartphone is on, even if you're not using it, the batteries are draining. And the more apps you have that are on in the background, even if you're not using them, but if you've got Facebook going on in the background and you've got maps going on, the GPS and things like that, they're all still sending out signals and they're all still receiving notifications in the background. You're not using it. The screen may be blank, but your phone is still doing something. And the more apps you have going on in the background, the faster your battery drains. Now, people who are empaths actually have more apps going on in the backgrounds of their bodies than they realize it. It's you're picking up on the energies of the sick person. You're picking up on the neediness of someone else. And it's not just a question of being aware that this person needs you, this person is sick. It's about absorbing the energies into the bodies. Again, not everybody does it. I don't want to put labels. I don't want to put limitations on people. I'm, this is really for the ones who do it. I want you to be aware that you do it because I realized that I do it. I realized that um, a huge part of what I, why I got sick was because I took on the energies into my own body. Um, so anyway, uh, it's about being aware and it's about recharging your battery. So number one, in order to turn off the apps in the background, it means saying no to the things that are not yours. It means saying no to the things that you really didn't want to do, but didn't have the heart to say no to. People who are empaths are prone to being people pleasers, doormats, because they find it really hard to say no, because they feel the emotions of other people and they find it really hard to differentiate between the other person's emotions and theirs. They can't compartmentalize that this is that person's emotions and this is mine. It's very hard. The lines are blurred. And so um, this is why it's really uh, important for us to actually even sit down at the end of the day and say, okay, what are the things I'm working on? Which of these things are actually mine and which are not? And I slowly have to ease myself off of these things that are not mine. Um, some of the things that are not yours, maybe you can't ease yourself off them. And it's fine. I mean, maybe some of the things are things like, as, um, in fact, as I even mentioned last week, things like taking care of an aging parent or taking care of a special needs child or young children, and they're draining you. But it's a non-negotiation. It's non-negotiable. You have to care for them. So the thing is to take off your plate the things you can, the things you've taken on that you've just taken on because you can't say no, but they're actually not yours. They're not your responsibility. Because another thing about empaths, we have a tendency to be rescuers. We have a tendency to go in and rescue people that have nothing to do with us. And maybe, and I'm not talking about being there to help people. Of course, you're there to help people who need you. But we have a tendency to rescue people who don't even need it. People who would do better to grow from learning from their mistakes than having us jump in and try and rescue them. So watch out for those tendencies. So those are also apps that are going on in the background. So start switching off all those apps. So that would be number two. Switching off apps would be learning to say no. Number three would be to do something every day 
that actually recharges your batteries. And this is not selfish. This is something that's really important because you become better and stronger for the people around you. And whatever it means doing, whether it's soaking in a tub, going to a movie, spending time alone, meditating, going for a walk, going to the beach, listening to music, whatever it is, your smartphone cannot go 48 hours without recharging batteries. And remember, just sleeping is not enough because how many of you wake up from your sleep still feeling exhausted and tired, thinking about everything you have to do that day? So no, you have to actually do something that recharges your batteries, something that has no other consequence except making you feel good. And that is so important. You know, I started understanding things like, oh my gosh, this is why I can't watch movies that are violent, that show blood and gore, because I actually feel it within my physical body. But the best part is that my husband, Danny, started understanding because he started relating it and mirroring it to his feelings of having Asperger's. And he goes, I know what it feels like now, what you're saying about overload of emotions, because even though he doesn't feel an overload of other people's emotions, he knows what it feels like to be sensitive to his surroundings of too much sound or too much light and needing to shut the curtains when the sun is shining outside. Whereas me, I love the sunshine. For me, the sunshine feels like it's it's invigorating. The sunshine recharges my batteries. That's something that really recharges my batteries. Now, I want to hear from all of you. I want to hear if you resonate with what I've said. I want to hear your questions. But I just want to say one other thing before I get into the questions. I know Danny has been looking at the questions, but real quick, I want to say something else. I do a, a show, a Hay House radio show every single Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific, and I take calls on that show. Last Wednesday, which was day before yesterday, a beautiful woman called up and I took her question two minutes before the end of the show. And I hate it when someone has a beautiful question, a deep question where she needs extra support and the show is ending. So this woman, and I wanted to put this question out to all of you because maybe you can even help her. So this lady, uh, I'm not going to say her name, but I will give you some details of the question. So this lady is 65 years old. She was married to the same man for more than half her life. I think she said either 30 or 35 years she was married to this man. And then she discovered that for the last six years, he's been having an affair with another woman. And he even has a child with this other woman. And of course she was devastated and it broke her heart. And subsequently she has gone through, I believe she's gone through a divorce. <laughs> Excuse me, that was a loud one. Sorry about that. Um, so subsequently, she's gone through a divorce. And um, the divorce and everything that's happened has actually um, depleted her finances. Now, she has never had a job or a career in her life because her husband has always taken care of her. So now she's at 65 with no husband, no job, and um, she doesn't have a career, and she doesn't know what to do. So this, okay, Danny has just <laughs> handed me a box of tissues, so thank you, darling. He sneaked up. That's another thing about him. He's an introvert. He hates being in front of the camera. He'll do everything behind the scenes, but he'll always stay behind the camera. But back to the question at hand, this beautiful lady, my heart really went out to her and I just wanted to hug her. So she's 65 years old. She has no career. She has never had a career, so she doesn't know what to do or what she can do. She's now um, without, uh, you know, she's alone basically. And she's been hurt badly by this man who she thought she would spend the rest of her life with. So my heart truly went out with her. She said she has already um, moved on from feeling hurt by it. She's basically forgiven him. And when I say forgiven him, it doesn't mean she condoned at all what he did. And she's definitely not going to allow that to happen again. 
but for her own sake, for her to be able to move on and live her life. So I would, so if you are listening in because I told her to tune into my Facebook Live, I wanted to give her question more airtime. I wanted to give it more attention. So if, if you're tuning in, beautiful lady, please, um, I'm going to ask everybody else listening if you have any suggestions uh, of help, of what you would do if you were in that situation, what you would suggest to someone would do, because truly my heart went out to her. And what I said is, um, I know many women that have started careers at that age. I believe Louise Hay started her career at that age. I think the people who start a career at a later age are really clear as to what they want to do and what they want to contribute in the planet. And the more clear you are, I truly believe that the universe will actually find you. The, the thing is about getting clarity within yourself. So start thinking about what you would like to be, what you would like to do. What would you spend, love to spend the rest of your life doing? What, is, what would your dream life look at? look like so start thinking about that and i would love to hear from you suggestions so that we can ask this beautiful lady to read the thread to read the comments and to see any suggestions that all of you have for her so thank you for listening and now let's go on to your questions i'm going to turn to danny and ask him what are the questions that that you've all posted and really anything goes you know um i'm open to anything there's a comment here before I get to questions from uh, Melissa Destien, who says, Yes, I was always a fixer until I decided to let go more often. Good one. Let go. That's another one in our, in our um, tools. Let go. <laughs> now, here's a question from Lorraine Belcourt Scott, who asks, So how do we stop absorbing? I feel like I'm being cold when I turn it off. So, so here's the, that's a great question. By the way, um, uh, I've seen these comments, uh, the comments before that everybody loves your voice. Boo. My voice? Yes, they do. No. And for, and by the way, I never call him Danny. So it feels really weird saying, oh, Danny, what's the next question? Uh, I call him Boo. <laughs> so there you have it. But anyway, you know, I want to tell you that it's Lorraine, right? I want to tell you that um, you're not being cold when you turn it off because you're not a cold person. And a lot of us who have this deep empathy for everybody, for the world, we immediately swing to the other extreme when we try to protect ourselves. We immediately think, oh my gosh, people are going to think I'm cold and I'm bitchy. But you really have to take care of yourself because you're not turning it off permanently. You're really not. What we need to do is to be able to, um, we need to be able to filter. And it's something that we start to learn. And the first thing, though, is awareness that you have a tendency to absorb it. That awareness alone will help you to see oh, I'm doing it again. I'm absorbing. I'm absorbing everybody's energy. I've started to become aware I do it. And, and so, for example, the difference between, let's say, I'm a sucker for all these ads where um, they show cute puppies or children that are suffering, and ads tend to do that. And of course, I'll fall for each one, and I'll want to help each one. Danny is the one who will point out to me that, you know, it's just an ad. And, and he's not trying to say, don't help the people because he's not cold hearted at all. In fact, he's the first one to jump in and rescue people when they need help. He's the first one to rescue animals. He loves animals. So he's very warm hearted and very sensitive, but he doesn't get fooled by advertisers, whereas empaths do. And that's the distinction I want to make. So thank you for that great question. <clears throat> Linda Abbott writes Hi Linda I, Abbott I wonder if constant fatigue is due to being an empath mm -hmm. Yes, so the thing is um, Danny is so much more energetic and robust than I am because he doesn't wear it he doesn't take it on I have to consciously 
um, recharge my batteries and remind myself, don't wear it, let it go, stop rescuing, stop feeling like it's my problem, stop feeling like I have to help everybody. Um, who do I think I am? And so, so yes, absolutely. Um, that's why it really is important. And if in the beginning, even if you have to spend 50% of your day in the beginning on yourself, don't feel it's selfish because your natural tendency is to help other people. So the more you help yourself, the more charge or battery you'll have or energy you'll have to use to help the world. Because here's the other, other thing I want to say is that people who are empaths feel this deep connection with the world and the emotions of other people. And they feel this calling or this yearning to help in some way, to change the world in some way. They feel this yearning to change the status quo. Empaths are also the ones who feel it most when something happens like a big school shooting. They feel it the most. They feel that I have to go out there and change things. But they're also the one that, you know, because social media can be such a minefield uh, out there, they're also the ones that people are going to attack and say, um, and s people of polarizing parties are going to attack that person. And immediately that attack is going to drain the empath. And they're going to feel, I only wanted to help. So you have to realize that the more energy you have, your default is to use that energy to help the world. You don't have to think about helping the world. You don't have to think about rescuing people. That's a given. Once you allow yourself to trust that my very genetic makeup is one that defaults to helping the world, it defaults to helping people. I don't need to hear messages of practice two acts, random acts of kindness every day, go out and save the world. You don't need to hear those messages because that is who you are. That's a given for you. You need the messages of it's not selfish to charge your batteries because once they're charged, it's a given that you're going to use it to help the world and help other people. So I hope you find that helpful. We have time for one last question. Great. And I think this is a brilliant question. Meadow Lynn Ferguson says, Hi, Anita. I have a very hard time when there's an altercation between someone and myself and they are upset with me for not doing enough for them when I have done everything I can possibly imagine to help. I can't help but think, have I done enough or have it or have I? Uh, so if you have, <clears throat> so here's the thing, this is a really interesting one because in actuality, um, a real relationship is not and you know, friendship, relationship, whatever, everything is a relationship. One party is not supposed to feel drained or they're not supposed to constantly feel, am I doing enough? Have I done enough? You're supposed to be yourself and being yourself is supposed to be enough for the other party. And that's really the most loving kind of relationship. You know, you need to want for that person what they want for themselves. They need to want for you what you what you want for yourself. It sounds like that that particular relationship is imbalanced and it may not be something that you wanted to hear because maybe it's somebody you really care about and you really love, but you really need to talk to that person because if you don't talk about it and if you don't shift the balance, you are going to be drained by trying to be someone you're not to win their love or to constantly feel you're not doing enough to please them. That's not a good position to be in. That's the position I used to always find myself in before I had the cancer. That was the person I used to be. And I had this big wake up call that told me my only responsibility is to be who I am, be who I am. And that's your only responsibility too, Meadowlin. Just be who you are. You don't need to be anything more, anything less, especially if you're an empath, be who you are. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'm sure 
I, at this moment, it's on the schedule for me to do one again on my Sunday morning. So please tune in if you're around. Uh, please sign up for my newsletter, check out my website, and tune in to my radio shows. And also, if I happen to be traveling to a town or a city where you are, uh, and if you're coming to one of my events, I'd love to see you. I'd love for you to come up and say, hey, perhaps at the book signing line. If you want to check out where I'll be speaking, check out the events tab. I'm doing a whole European tour in May and I'd love to see you all and perhaps maybe even on the cruise next week if you're on the cruise. Love you guys and until next time see you soon. Bye!